All of our discussions about cosets have been leading up to this point, Lagrange's theorem, and the hard work is done. We've pretty much proven this already based on our previous results, and I'll leave links in the description to the videos I'm talking about where we prove some stuff about cosets. We'll be using a couple of previous results in this video. We'll begin by showing how those results lead to Lagrange's theorem. Then we'll see some interesting consequences of Lagrange's theorem concerning groups of prime order. We'll finish by discussing the index of a subgroup. So here's the theorem. Let G be a finite group and H a subgroup of G. The order of G is a multiple of the order of H. That's Lagrange's theorem. If you have a group, any of its subgroups must have an order that divides the order of the containing group. And this theorem follows from two results which we've previously proven. We've proven that if G is a group and H a subgroup of G, then the family of all cosets H a, as a ranges over G, is a partition of G. So you take a subgroup of G, all of the cosets of that subgroup make a partition of the group G. Additionally, all of the cosets of any particular subgroup group will have the same number of elements. So we've proven both of these results and together they establish Lagrange's theorem. Let's quickly see the details of how that is. If we've got a finite group G, how many elements does G have? Well, we can denote it like this, the cardinality or magnitude of G, the number of elements that it has. And since we know that if H is a subgroup of G, then the cosets of H partition the group G, we know that the number of elements in G must just be the sum of the numbers of elements in all the different cosets of any subgroup H. So we could call those cosets HA1, HA2, and so on. Given an arbitrary subgroup H, we don't know how many cosets it might have. Let's just say it has N of them. So we would have HA1, HA2, all the way up through HAN. In this case, each AI is just some element of the group G. Since these are all the cosets of the subgroup H in the group G, that makes up a partition of G. So if we add up the number of elements in all of these distinct cosets, that will be the number of elements in G. And let me reiterate that these elements A1 through AN are not the N elements of G. We don't know how many elements G has. N is the number of cosets of the subgroup H. So these should all be distinct cosets. So the order of G is just the sum of the orders of all of the cosets. But as we said previously, we know that all the cosets of any particular subgroup have the same orders. So instead of writing this as the order of HA1 plus the order of HA2, etc., we could just write this as the order of HA1 over and over again n times because all of these cosets have the same order. So we can write that the order of G is in fact equal to n times the order of this particular coset HA1, where again n is the number of cosets of the subgroup H. But we also know that the order of any coset is the order of the subgroup itself since a given subgroup is itself a coset. If you just compose it with the identity element, that gives you a coset which is identical to the subgroup. So the cardinality of HA1, whatever that coset is, its cardinality or order is the same as the order of the subgroup H. And there we go. Given an arbitrary subgroup H using properties of its cosets, we can see that the order of the group G must equal N times the order of the subgroup. N is just the number of cosets that the subgroup has, but regardless, we see that the order of the group is a multiple of the order of the subgroup. That's Lagrange's theorem. We could state this theorem another way by saying that a group G can have subgroups only with orders that divide its own. However, the converse of this is not true. So if a group has order 8, then its subgroups must have orders 1, 2, 4, or 8. 
but it's not the case that it must have a subgroup of all of those orders. Any subgroup that it has has to be of one of those orders, but it's not guaranteed that it will have a subgroup of all of those orders. So the converse of Lagrange's theorem is not true. All right, quick application of Lagrange's theorem. If a group G has 12 elements, it may have subgroups of what orders? By Lagrange's theorem, the order of any subgroup must divide the order of the original group. So the subgroups of G may have orders 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, or 12, all the divisors of 12. Again, it's not the case that the group must have a subgroup of all of these orders, but any subgroup it does have must have one of these orders. And I'll leave it to you to find a counterexample to the converse of Lagrange's theorem. I don't want to go through that in this lesson because I want to focus on the theorem itself. Another example, if G has seven elements, this is interesting, it may have subgroups of what orders? Well, seven is prime, so the only possibilities would be that the subgroup has one element, which indeed will always be a subgroup. That's the trivial subgroup, which contains only the identity. And then the only other possibility is the group G itself, which has order seven in this case, and that, of course, is also always a subgroup. Every group is a subgroup of itself. So Lagrange's theorem tells us a lot about groups of prime order. Right now we can see that any group of prime order can only have two subgroups, the trivial subgroup and then the group itself. Neither of these would be considered proper subgroups. So by Lagrange's theorem, a group of prime order has no proper subgroups. But using what we know about cyclic subgroups, even more can be said. And I'll leave a link in the description to my lessons about cyclic groups and cyclic subgroups. If we say that G is a group of prime order, let's say its order is P, what more can we say about G with Lagrange's theorem? Well, if we take an element from the group G that isn't the identity, then the order of the element, the power that we must raise it to to get the identity back, is some integer m that's not equal to 1. If a to the power of 1 was the identity, meaning its order is 1, well, that would contradict the fact that we're saying it's not the identity. So if we take a non-identity element from a group of prime order, then the order of the element is some integer m that's not equal to 1. Thus, the cyclic subgroup generated by this element A will, by definition, have m elements. But then, by Lagrange's theorem, this m must divide P, the order of the group G. Now, we already said that m, the order of this element A, is not equal to 1. But if m divides the prime number P, the only other possibility remaining is that m equals p, which means the cyclic subgroup generated by this arbitrary non-identity element A, the cyclic subgroup generated by this, must in fact be the entire group G. That was a lot of words. Let's spin it one more time. We've got a group of prime order. Let's say its order is P. If we take an element from G that's not the identity, then the order of that element, by definition of order, has to be some integer M that's not equal to 1. Then, if we look at the cyclic subgroup generated by this non-identity element A of order M, the cyclic subgroup must have m elements. And by Lagrange's theorem, this order of the subgroup m must divide the order of the group p. So the order is p, m must divide it. But p is prime, and m isn't 1. So the only thing left that m could equal is p, which means the cyclic subgroup contains all p elements of the original group. And so if we take a non-identity element from a group of prime order and then look at the cyclic subgroup generated by that non-identity element, it will always equal the original group of prime order. And so this pretty much settles business on all groups of prime order. We could call this a theorem. If G is a group with prime order P, then this group must be cyclic. And every non-identity element of the group will be a generator. So up to isomorphism, we understand every single group of prime order now. There's only one of any prime order. The only group of order 3, for example, 
is the Additive Integers Mod 3. Any other group of order 3 will be isomorphic to this one. The only group of order 7 is the Additive Integers Mod 7. Any other group of order 7 will behave just like this one, and so on. Pretty sweet. Finally, let's quickly cover the index of a subgroup. If G is a group with subgroup H, the number of cosets of H in G is called the index of H in G, and it's denoted like this. Now, as we talked about previously, the order of a group G, if it's got some subgroup H, well, the order of G is equal to the order of the subgroup H, multiplied by the number of cosets that H has in the group G. And we've just defined the number of cosets that H has. We've called that the index of H in the group G. So we could write this equation. Again, this is because however many cosets H has, altogether they make up a partition of the group G and they all have the exact same order as the subgroup H. So the number of elements that G has is just the number of elements in all of these cosets, they all have order of H elements, multiplied by the number of cosets there are, which is the index of H in G. Then, dividing both sides of this equation by the order of H, we get a formula for the index of a subgroup. Given a finite group G and a subgroup H, the index of H in G is just the order of G divided by the order of H. So that's Lagrange's theorem and the story of every prime group ever. Again, Lagrange's theorem says that for a finite group G and any subgroup subgroup H, the order of G must be a multiple of the order of H. So the order of a subgroup must divide the order of the containing group. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you've got any questions.